Okay. So I'll share okay, my screen. So I'm going to stop my OBS. So, that... yeah. so I'll share my screen here again. And uh, I mean, I will simply sum that. Let's say I'm starting all, all over again. But anyway, uh, this agenda is on the MD. I send on the Gitcoin server and on the FDD server. Uh, the first part is going to be really about running the workflows. Workflows, they essentially encapsulate most of the steps so that, I mean, if you have a operator, he doesn't need to go too deep into the code. There are some simple commands that he can pass, like Python dash MGC said, name your workflow. And those workflows, they are going to do the main, let's say, the main piece of stories that one should do for, I mean, doing the day to day operations. And I'm going to go all over them. And also, I'm going to explain a bit uh, how they work and, I mean, what you need to have in order to execute them. Uh, after that, I'm also going to show a bit uh, their output on the GCS bucket. So I'm going to show how the data looks like. And also after that, uh, I'm going to show us uh, exactly how to set up the environment so that you can execute all the workflows because there are a lot of pieces in there. So I'm going to show uh, what are the files that you need, how they look like, and also where you could get them. And also how you would do some steps like, for example, creating here the data syncs. And I, the nuance is also involved with them. I'm, after all of this is done, I'm going to execute some integration tests on VS Code just to show that everything is working. And I mean, I think this will take some time, but after all of this is done, uh, we'll have some homework here for the next workshop. Specifically, we need to chew, uh, the community needs to chew in order to be able to run out the workflows. I'm going to explain them by the end of the, uh, this workshop. But there, there, are, there are also other desirable items here that, I mean, it's not exactly required because if we do not have, we can sort of arrange uh, without too much work. But those two here, they depend with talking with the Gitcoin production team, so they need to be arranged before. So, yeah. So I said before, I'm going to start with the set workflows. I'm going to type some comments here just to show you guys how it looks like. Uh, just before starting here, do you guys have any quick questions, any quick comments just before I start? Um, I think it's great. Like you're with the uh, Google Cloud Platform, what are you doing? Just, just go for it. Uh, yeah. So. I'm going to execute here the workflows with the assumption that the environment is already set up because I did do some prep here. So the most important workflow of all, in my opinion, is this prepare predict here. Uh, it's going to take a bit of time to run. So what I'm going to do is the following. I'm going to run that. And as this is running, I'm going to explain a bit how it works. So there is a catch that this prepare predict. It, it's really about retrieving data. So it retrieves data, data from GitHub, but also from Gitcoin for the uh, Gitcoin PostgreSQL database. And what happens is that this PostgreSQL database requires an static IP. So what I'm going to do here, I do have a VPN. It's a personal VPN. Uh, we needed to have a VPN for that for the DAO in order to this to work for everyone. But this was a workaround that we did for Hans 12. I'm going to connect, to connect here. So, I mean, this VPN has a dedicated IP, so it has a static IP. And when I connect to that, I'm going to be able to connect to the uh, database. So let's just wait a bit here while it's, it's working. Sometimes it takes a bit. But one thing about uh, this homework here uh, is because, uh, I mean, in order to have, uh, I mean, in order, in order to access data, the database, we need that IP. So I think that the, the easiest way of having a static IP is really to just having a private VPN somewhere. Ideally, this would be provided by some kind of cloud, but uh, a very quick and dirty solution is really to, let's say, just, I mean, just take a subscription of pure VPN and go with it. It's not optimal, but I mean, uh, you have a $80 uh, dollars charge and solves the issue for one year. I mean, it, it solves the, the issue to set up a token yeah. instead of an IP address for, for you know, to, to have a trusted uh, 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 access. So how can you ask that KP where, I mean, you have full control over the infra, I think it's, be it's the best solution long term. 
Pure PP in here is really a workaround. I mean, uh, if we need a, a, a static IP address quickly, uh, this is going to solve. But I mean, I do not think this is a good long term solution. It's a very short term solution. But okay, we have it here. So I'm connected here. This VPN is associated with a that kit IP. And then we can start to run, uh, run the workflow. So just like me. Yeah. So I'm going to run here the going to run the first workflow, which is the prepare PD. So I said before, this is going to retrieve the data and it's going to generate the feature data set and it's going to store everything on the data lake that I, I did set up. So it's going to be Python dash M GTC said. So this is just to execute the module. They pass the number of the workflow. So prepare PG. Um, usually, oh, what happened here? Invalid should, ah, okay. So actually it's prepare prediction. There was a typo here. So I'm going to update that. Okay. So it's going to start by retrieving the PSQL data after it's going to run the GitHub. So while it is executed here below, I think we could, I mean, do a walk through on that workflow to see what it means. So when you pass dash MGTC said, what you are really doing is going here on the GTC said folder, going on the main file. And there are all those workflows here that are mapped to the argument. So if we want to see what happens with the prepared prediction, it's really this one here. So what it's doing is here you retrieve out the hand data sources. And if you jump to there, it's really, there is a section here for pulling data from PSQL. There is another one here for GitHub. Uh, for GitHub, it's a bit more extensive because there is a choice between, I mean, you can select to scrap because what is going to happen is that I'm going to extract several contributions from PostgreSQL. So for example, right now I'm going to pull uh, 600 uh, contributions. So 600 contributions, they map to 200 users. And there is a question. I need to have the GitHub information for those, those users. So I need to scrap data from GitHub. Uh, the question is the following. Uh, should, should we scrap out the information at once or should we scrap only the data for the GitHubers which we still do not have the information? So there is some logic here. Yeah, uh, uh, ah, go on. Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, you were basically pulling from the post or PSQL database, right? Is that pointing to the GitHub or Gitcoin? database so the psql is from as for the gitcoin production database is okay yeah so it's executed that query here i mean you could modify that and by the way the start and the end time here they are parameters i'm going to go over them uh, afterwards but yeah you could even change that query i mean if you have idea if, if you have any field on the database that you may want, uh, you can you simply modify that query and you are going to have it. Yeah, I mean, we don't, I don't think anybody but you has the uh, creds to run this query though. Yeah, uh, I don't think so. So in order to execute the SAD as it is, we need the credentials. But, but uh, the credentials, I think it's easy. If you send a message, I think they, they are going to get you all the credentials in the same day. The most difficult step is really getting the static IP. They do require that. Yeah. And the static IP, as I said, there is the long-term solution, which is we all test the IP on our infrastructure that we have uh, full control. And there is the short-term solution, which is, I mean, Simply subscribe to a VPN that has a dedicated IP, which is what I'm doing right now. So yeah, uh, so it already here pulled out the data. Now it's uh, writing everything to the data lake. So the data lake in this case, it's being a GCS bucket. I'm going to show it uh, shortly. But yeah, uh, just showing some features here. So this hit review is really get, uh, getting the, that query there. And, and there is a thing that, I mean, I must uh, tell at some point, but uh, on the connection context, there is this parameter called GitHub diff scrap, which 
I mean, uh, when you are getting out those contributions data, you want to get the GitHub information, uh, you have the option if you, for example, you want to scrap everyone or you just want to scrap the users which we, we do not have information yet. So right now, uh, the, I mean, I'm going to go over the connection context uh, after that. Uh, but right now, the way that I did set up here is I'm only going to collect the, inf the information for the users which I do not have yet. The reason being because of my experience, uh, scrapping it can be, can, be way, can be a lot slow, can be very slow. Pulling data from the contributions, for example, PostgreSQL is very fast, but yet GitHub can be very slow and there are quota limits. So I got a error here, connection aborted and time out. And the reason being is that the internet that I'm using right now, it's not very good, it's a satellite. And I'm losing 10 to 20% of the <laughs> package. Uh, but, but I promise you guys, this, this works. If you have internet that does not have 20% of package loss, it's going to work. Uh, I played it test that, that year. And I guess the time it take. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah it, it's really tough. Let's say I'm not a. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm definitely not on a production level internet right now. But but this works. Uh, I mean, it, it was having work. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, this concludes the prepared uh, prediction workflow. And I mean. I think that I can show a bit the uh, output here. I mean, I'm going to make a nonlinear use of that agenda, but I think this will help. So what I'm showing here on my screen is really the explorer for the Google Cloud buckets that I do have on a Gitcoin project. So this is sort of a block science internal uh, project. Uh, I mean, I'm okay with sharing with that, but uh, we were doing that more as a pro I mean, more, more is a provisional thing rather than a permanent thing, but I, I'm super okay with sharing access if you guys uh, think it, it could be interesting and, and definitely create a backup for the, how to 12. But just so, to show how it looks like. So I'm going to enter here how to 13. This bucket here for how to 13, uh, it was really a test bucket. I was doing some tests uh, last, uh, last week so just to make sure that everything is working. But for how to 12, we have the, the heal thing. So when I did run the um, prepare predict workflow, essentially what I did generate are is two things here. It's the hunt data folder and the features folder. So I'm going to go over them just to show how it looks like. So first with the hunt data. So hunt data is just the data as it is, uh, data without any transformation. And Every time that you hunt the prepare prediction, you are going to create a folder, a new folder on those folders. So those will be folders that are going to have the current timestamp. The reason being is that it's a good practice to always keep provenance. So any data that you generate, any flag that you generate, anything that you push to the input, I, I mean, any transformation that you do, uh, it's important to not only start the output, but also the intermediate results to make sure that if we need to redo the calculations, we can, let's say, do the entire history again. So it's going to it's taking a bit here. Uh, I think maybe more 30 seconds. So let's be a bit patient here. Well, I'll leave that. Well, I think that I will leave that running so while I execute the, the second workflow here. So the second workflow here is prepare training. So what it does is the following. Uh, I mean, the, the main output of the prepare training is really just one. Uh, it's to generate labels, labels that are going to be used for the fit process. And those labels, they do have two sources, as you guys probably know. Uh, one is the human evaluations. The second one is the heuristics. And I do think it's important to have bots, especially at the beginning of the hunt, because what happens is that if you do not have enough human evaluations at the beginning or something like that, uh, you are not going to have labels. So you cannot fit anything and you cannot predict anything if you do not have anything fitted. So the risks they are very useful actually for bootstrapping the process in order to make sure that 
uh, the civil detection process works smoothly since the beginning, since the point uh, time zero. So the prepare, prepare training is going to, uh, I mean, it's going to go over the features that I have uh, created on the prepare predict. Based on that, it's going to apply the risk. So it's going to create a set of labels. And also it's going to retrieve the, uh, every, everything that come out from the human evaluations. And it's going to create a second set of labels. And it's going to merge those two sets of labels into one that is going to be used for the machine learning process. So I'm going to run that. Um, and one interesting thing is that, for example, the credentials here for the PostgreSQL, I only require those credentials for prepare predict. And actually what I'm going to do here in order to make my internet a bit faster is to disconnect here. Hopefully this will make things a bit better, but let's go with it. Yeah, so basically you need your VPN just to access the, uh, the, the database and then you can. Yes, exactly. Prepare your training with, the, yeah, okay. Yeah, so I'm going to run here. While it is happening, let me see if it, uh... ah, good. Ah, not good. Uh, so I think it, let me try again here. So I'm going to do a walkthrough here on the prepare training so that we understand what's happening uh, there. there. So I said, let's go here to the main. So I said before, we can simply go here to prepare human about workflow and see what's happening. So what is doing is the following. First, it opens the parents.json file. And I think this parents.json file is exactly used on a lot of places. So if we go, for example, to prepare prediction, I think, it, yeah, the default connection contest, ah, no, no, it is not used. So, where it is here, you may have oh, got less. Oops, prepare thing. So, ah, sorry, I, I got it uh, wrong. I, I did click the you may vow instead of the prepare thing. So, yeah, so let's see what, what exactly this prepare training is doing. Uh, first, it retrieves the uh, home data. It, it, it is not the feature data set, it's the home data. So, just to show uh, what comes out from it. Uh, it's getting essentially, let's say, the, uh, the database that we did collect from the uh, PostgreSQL, which is being this Metabase DF, and also the data, database that we did get from the GitHub. And we got another timeout, so let me send that again. And after I have this home data, there is this retrieve thresholds here. And this retrieve uh, thresholds, it's really about uh, getting the uh, heuristic labels. So the exact farm here, uh, let me see where it, it is. So it's loading from a file. So that file is being computed somewhere. Let me see. Yeah, I don't quite remember where I did. Uh, let me see here. Yeah, so there is a weird thing that for some reason the risks are not being actually computed here. Uh, I mean, maybe this was that was a bug on the pull request. Uh, because I mean, what did happen is that uh, we did merge the sad and the Azop repo, so it may be, I'm going to take note of that. So I, I'm going to figure that between tomorrow, uh, today and tomorrow. It's good that we did the, do that walk, walkthrough because if not, I'm, I would not be, have noticed that. But let's say supposedly on this retrieve threshold, it was supposed to, let's say, give it a set of features. I need to compute uh, those, uh, ah, I think it's those prepare labels. Ah, sorry, I uh, understand now. So actually the, the risks are being computed here on the prepare labels. So those prepared labels here, they do use some uh, set, uh, set of heuristics. So for example, there are heuristics for the contributions and the GitHub profiles. 
for the contributions, the method is the following. Uh, there is some criteria here for the IP address. So uh, the way of navigating that is the following. Uh, if the user has, uh, if you have, for example, uh, you have one IP address and that IP address has more than one user associated to that IP. Uh, what is going to happen is that if a, a single IP has multiple users, all the users that are associated with that cluster, they are going to be marked as potentially uh, suspicious. So uh, there is also some risk here for the GitHub profiles. Uh, the criteria here is really the creation date. So if the creation date is very close to the uh, to the hound start and also other things like, for example, uh, he does not have public repositories and he does not have followers and so on, uh, he can be marked as potentially uh, suspicious. If together with the IP address, I mean, if he has bought, it's going to be marked as suspicious. And there is also the opposite. Because, for example, there are users that have, for example, a lot of uh, followers and it has been created a long time ago. So somewhere here also have a, a risk for the opposite. Instead of, let's say, creating the set of the suspicious users, we also have a, a set of the trusted users. Uh, I think that, let's say, doing a, I mean, we have some comments here. I do not want to go too deep into that. But the main point is that we do use that for bootstrapping in order to make sure that we have a set of uh, labels having real uh, human evaluations at the beginning. After we have enough uh, human evaluations, uh, the risk is they start to having a very tiny weight. And actually on the last round, if I'm not uh, wrong, I think that the risk flag is was less than 80% uh, of the flags. I think that maybe 30% was, I think 20% was contributions, 8% was the risk, and the remainder one was flags from the machine learning uh, prediction. But, uh, but okay, uh, it did run here. So just to go over here, what did happen? So yeah, I did pass here prepared training. So there were some errors, but in the end, uh, it was timeout and it got solved uh, after that. But they did download the home data. And, and after, uh, let's say, uh, there was this step here about retrieving human labels. So this interview on my lab is really out here. There is a command here for getting the credentials, another for getting the human label. So retrieving human labels is really going to the spreadsheet and uh, getting whatever is that. And after I have the human labels and the risks, there is a there is an important step, and I think it, it's important to, to me to show here because it's one of those places where you can have a bit of a I mean, you, you, you need to make a decision. And the decision is the following. Uh, I'm going to show here, for example, how the sheet look like. So, so let me open here. So this is the human evaluation sheet. And as you guys probably remember for, from Hans 12, uh, we have two questions for each evaluation. The first question is the following. Uh, is this user a CBU, true or false? And the second is, what's your confidence level? Uh, low, so, so, or high? And there is a thing that, let's say, uh, you, can, you can say that, let's say, it's a decision point that we have, which is really about converting, let's say, those two answers into numbers so that we can apply a threshold and tell the machine, oh, this user is civil and this user is not civil. So the way that we do that is through this, um, where it is here. Ah, okay. It, it, it is through this evaluation score function here. So let me show how it looks like. So essentially what it's going to do is, it's going to go over each evaluator sheet. It's going to take each user that has been evaluated by that evaluator and it's going to apply a whole. And the whole is, the, is, is this one. So the idea here is the following. Uh, if the user has been marked as ECBU and the confidence is high, the score is one. If it, the confidence is so, so it's going to be 450 and low is going to be 350. And if it's the uh, answer is uh, false, 
uh, you are going to have the, the opposite uh, case because I mean, if you if the evaluator has high confidence that it's not severe, the score is zero. If the confidence is low, uh, it's two fifths. So, ah, by the way, this is not needed. Um, so this is an important point because uh, I mean, this is a decision. There is no clear, let's say, I mean, there is no clear reason of, let's say, of why we should scale in that way. There is no reason of why it should be, should be, let's say, a linear function based on that combination. It could be, for example, other scores. And not only that, but uh, if you are, for example, assigning those combinations here into numbers bet between zero and one, uh, this also generates another question, which is the following. Uh, what's the right threshold to me to tell that, for example, our user is CB or not? So on round 12, uh, the way that we did uh, assigned labels was the following. Uh, the only users that were considered CBIL was the ones that were true on the CBIL and high confidence. So essentially we have a threshold of 80%. If it's above 80%, it's CBIL. If, it below, if it's below 80%, it's not CBIL. So this is important, uh, I mean, this is an important uh, thing to keep in mind. So yeah, and yeah. By the way, I'm a CB with high confidence. Uh, actually, I'm just a. Uh, I'm just. <laughs> so yeah, going back here to the prepare training. Yeah. So yeah, here I set, for example, the CB hands uh, based on the the flags, and the flags here they are essentially being a concatenation with the risks and human labels. And I have a, I mean, this label here is simply a dictionary of sets. And ah, by the way, uh, one thing about uh, those workflows, uh, because you can see that a lot of functions they start with retrieve, and a lot of functions start uh, start with store. If they start with retrieve, uh, most probably it's going to be about going to the data lake and downloading the date uh, data, and store is going to be about storing that on the data lake. So when I call, for example, retrieve round data, what I'm going to, what I'm actually doing is to go over this round 13 bucket here, select the last, last, last uh, the, the most recent folder. So for example, when I did the evoke prepare training now, uh, just now, I did a download from that folder here because this is the most recent one. And let's see if I can open it that. Now so open the feature data set. Well, uh, I'll leave it open while we continue here because it can be a bit slow. But that's it. Uh, that's it for the prepared training workflow. We still have uh, four authors here, but I think those are, uh, those are going to be a bit uh, quicker. Uh, by the way, guys, uh, any questions so far? Any comments? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so you used terraform to spin up these uh like what what exactly is that used for i know i know that uh you have like the bucket and stuff does it create that or it's possible to use terraform i think that the menu actually did work here on some terraform files uh but to be frank uh, it's not very hard if you are running locally uh, the only thing that you need is a gcs bucket uh, but of course, if you need to deploy, uh, there are some that they have some files here for deploying a Google Cloud uh, App Engine application. I didn't have the, too much time to test it, so be, but I mean, it could be a starting point if we deploy that into a backend service. And I think that there are some things here also for creating a VPN, but uh, I was not able to test it effectively. I was not, not exactly sure if we were going to use uh, Google Cloud. But for now, if you are running locally, oh. uh, the only thing that we need is a GCS bucket, nothing more. Okay, and the GCS bucket holds the human evaluation outputs? So everything that, um, so let me see how I put it. Uh, yeah, uh, so, so the human evaluation sheets, it's a bit of an interesting case because it's a sink and a source at the same time. Um, 
So the human evaluation itself, it's, it is on this sheet, but what happens is that when you invoke prepare training, it's going to go over this sheet and it's going to store that on the bucket. Uh, because accessing the data oh. from the sheet is not very fast and accessing from the data lake is very fast. So, yeah. Um, okay. And actually, let me show here. So, for example, the, the outputs from the humans, the evaluations, it's contained here on the human flags. So it's going to be a bit slow here. So I'm going to, by the way, let me download that feature CSV just to show how it looks like. But the, part, but the pattern of the, this uh, bucket is all that. You are going to have a subfolder uh, which indicates, let's say, what the data is, another subfolder which tells the timestamp. By default, the SAD is always going to consume the, uh, the most recent uh, timestamp. Uh, depending on the kind of data, you are going to have different formats. So how data is a HDL file, because HDL file allows you to have uh, heterogeneous data uh, sources. So we, you have one key for the SQL data, which is a tabular one, another key for the uh, GitHub data, which is, a, I think it's a JSON file. And the features is really a tabular data set with where each index is a user, so it's more cleaner. Let me, let me see if I can download that. Uh, and uh, so I, I have a, another question. Why um why why are you using GCP or like a bucket for the the data storage instead of just storing everything locally? Uh, the reason being is that, for example, um, suppose that I want to hunt this. Uh, this uh, service on the back on a backend. I want it to be a backend service instead of doing being a script. Uh, what is going to happen is that the state of the application needs to be somewhere. So it could be the local data source, uh, but there is a tricky thing because in that case you are mixing essentially. Uh, so there are two ways actually of uh, storing locally. One way, for example, is you simply store on the same repo. So you are mixing application uh, code with, uh, with data, which is a valid decision, but usually I do not like that because I mean, it quickly generates overhead on the repository. Another one is you yeah. store that locally in another folder, but then how you think that, uh, how you think that? Uh, you could use yeah. Git for syncing, but uh, in that case, you are using GitHub as a data lake. Uh, so, I mean, it's a decision. In the end, I think that the main reason of why I did use uh, GCS is really because, I mean, it is, it's more scalable. So if you have, for example, really large files, you are not going to have a problem. Um, and also you have more fine control, for example, on permissioning, and also you have some features that allow, for example, not deleting, uh, so it's a decision point, uh, but the point is for a scale scalable application and one that let's say needs to keep track of the state somewhere. And um, especially because when we did a uh, write wrote that script, we were thinking on a backend application. We were not thinking on using that as a local script. Uh, but and and I, I still think that this is a good goal. But it's, it's just that let's say it requires development time. Um, okay, um, just to show here. So for example, the feature is uh, .csv .gz. Uh, actually the .gz uh, extension is misleading because I had a bug and I need, needed to drop the .gz compression. But if we look at that, I mean, it's not clearly obvious, but I mean, we are going to have, for example, several users here at the beginning. And if you go way deeper, you are going to have several numbers which represent certain features. Uh, if you download uh, that file and load on the Excel, you are going to see a more beautiful thing than just that. But it's just to show that, let's say, it's being stored there. And also to show the human flag. So let me open here the latest one, which we just generated right now. So let me download here. Yeah, let's say well, I've, one of the reasons of, so of using the, let's say GCS uh, as a data lake rather than a local, like for example, a repo is because 
yeah, it could be more future proof if it were to be scalable and used by lots of people with different credentials. But yeah. Uh, so, for example, yeah, I like GCP. Yeah. Uh, so, for example, this stage is on that prepared train is, uh, is generating when I collect data from the sheets. Uh, the first key, the first foot here is being the name of the sheet. And this is an important thing to keep in mind uh, because the way that the prepared train is set up allows you to have some uh, non conventional uses of how human biology is supposed to be done. So, for example, one thing that did happen on past rounds is that, for example, Joy did have a list of active, active squelches. And uh, the way that I did implement that on the ASOP was the following. I did create here, for example, a sheet called uh, squelches. And Joy sent me a list of users and, for example, like something like user one and user two and user three. And I simply marked everyone as true, 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 and put this high, high, high. And if you assign a name that makes sense, uh, you can keep track of that. So this is an uh, important thing to have in consideration. Uh, because in the end, uh, this spreadsheet for human evaluation is really a way of, let's say, allow you to have a direct say about what the uh, uh, algorithm is going to use as labels. Because what is going to happen is that by having these squelches here, I go here, I'm going to have, for example, a squelch key. And of course, inside that, I'm going to have another mapping, and you are going to have users, and everything that has been answered on the sheet. So ECBO, confidence, notes, uh, Gitcoin only, GitHub only. Uh, everything that is on the columns here is going to go back there. And you, and, and every, uh, and I mean, you are, and this is an interesting thing because given that we are generating that every time that we run prepare training, uh, we are also able to keep provenance and also see, for example, how things did evolve over time and so on. So when you have that, the data lake and you keep track of the provenance, you have this uh, temporal data. You can have, let's say, see how it did evolve over time. So you, you could have actually some pretty interesting analysis. I don't think that we have unleashed the full potential of that. Especially when you have, you have, for example, data for multiple rounds and so on. I mean, uh, it's not a good mine. So yeah, I, I think we are good here with the prepared training. So let's go to the next workflows. So the next one here is the feed. So let me, let me run here. So I'm going to clean here because there is uh, there are too much things here. So Python-M feed. I'm going to run here and let, and essentially what this does is get the labels, uh, get the features, uh, train a model and start that model somewhere. So I'm going to show here how it works. Uh, if we go here to the main, there is this feed workflow here. And I mean, it doesn't go simpler than that. It's really, let's say, go to the features here, get this features.csv, the last, latest one, go to the retrieval labels here and these retrieval labels, I it's going to be this labels folder here. So this is an interesting thing to keep in mind because once you have a data lake, it's not that you need full connectivity for everything. For some things, like for example, fit, uh, you are going to simply train in relation in regards to whatever data you need, you have. So you can have some things like, for example, you collect data and yeah. Uh, I think I, I skip a bit that discussion, but yeah. Uh, so let me see if I can show here the also the labels folder. Now it's going to take a while. So going back here, fit uh, and the fit. Uh, this is our model, by the way, it's just a pickle file. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to just train a SQL learn model that has fit and predict models, stories a pickle file. And whatever I need to predict the new data, I'm just going to load that pickled file. So, and the other to see how the fit works here. Uh, I mean, I have the features here, I have the labels, and I did define here a grid search over a random forest regressor. I fit that and that's it. And the reason 
and, and, and the thing you can ask me, uh, why we are using that? The reason is that we did a do a exploratory, exploratory data analysis uh, uh, some time ago, I think it, it was on round 11. And we didn't notice that, let's say, it had a good performance and so on. So generally speaking, it, it worked well. Uh, but the thing is, there is no need for necessarily using a uh, random forest. So for example, if we decide to use, for example, XGBoost, uh, this is the place to do it. But it's important to note that, let's say, in the fit process, we need to we need to be already sure, let's say, about how is going to be the exact method that we're going to use to fit. So for example, do we define taper parameters beforehand? Or for example, do we do some kind of search before? So this fit method, I mean, provided features and labels, uh, anything that you need to do would be here. But but the place of, let's say, uh because hey guys. i think this uh, did close the re recording and uh okay it's getting back all right yep so where did i stop uh maybe you can start like a few two three minutes earlier we lost you about, about uh two minutes ago ah okay so when you when you guys did lose me uh was I already explaining here the fit workflow? Guys? Yeah, you can. Uh... Yeah, you okay. were explaining using the random force, uh, that choice. That's for ah, okay. our last version. Yes. So the issues here about the handle force is that if we want to use another module, uh, this fit, fit method is the place where we would plug it. So, for example, if. So, do, do, do you want to. Uh... Ah, hey guys. <laughs> so, yeah, let's yeah, hope that. You, you... Yeah, so essential zero of the fit. As I said, if you want to include another model like XG, XG boost, that would be the place. Any parameters that we have decided or search over them, uh, it's going to be plugged here, provided that it has access to the features and the labels. And this is not the place to validate the model. This is just the place to train. So any validation of the model, uh, making sure that, I mean, this is the right choice, needs to be done beforehand. It needs to be done through exploratory data analysis. So one important thing to keep in mind is that ideally to work on the civil detection, you should have a clear distinction about, let's say, what's work during the round and what's work between the rounds. Because during the rounds, we cannot have too much doubts about the model that is running. But let's say the right now moment to have, for example, any doubts to, let's say, to try out, for example, any new models and better ways of searching and so on, it's really during between rounds where we have ample time for doing any ex exploratory data analysis. And for example, it's possible to also to print some metrics. Uh, beforehand, we did pr print, for example, things like the cross-validation score and so on. Most of the time it was something about like uh, 93, not 95%, so it was not being exactly useful. But yeah, uh, if, if we need metrics about that, it, it would be on this fit, uh, method that let's say we would do any comment in order to I mean do any upgrade. And as I said before, uh, after this is fitted, we simply pickle that and start to the data lake as a pickle file. So let me see if I can show that. So I'm going to show here a lab, but I'm going also to show here how the model looks like. I'm also going to here top the predictions and the CSP output so that when it gets the time, it's already loaded. Let me close that because we already went that into that. Yeah. So while it is this loads, I would simply continue here. So okay. Now we have to predict, to prepare human vow and push any points. So predict is really let's say you have features, you have the pickled model and give me new new labels. So just to show it how it works here. 
And definitely let me run that. So I pass here P, P, GTC says predict and where's the main file here so that I can show the definition. Predict workflow. And yeah, uh, get features, get model, predict, start predictions, flag users and start flags. So this predict here is, I mean, uh, it, it can go simpler than that. It's really give me features, give me model prediction. It's, it's really just that. Uh, the place where, let's say, maybe it's more important to talk about is we, it's really safe flag users because there is a bit of home for subjectivity here. You cannot stop there is a flagging threshold here. So this flagging threshold is the following. Because what is happening is that uh, the current ML model that we are using is a regressor. And the regressor assigns, a, it's a handle forest regressor, so it assigns a number between zero and one. But every, the, every classifier, there are a lot of class, classifiers that let's say they do have some hand put that is between zero and one. So what's happening here is that we, we actually mark as true uh, the ones that they score is above a certain threshold. And I don't think that let's say having that threshold is exactly an interesting thing because under the hood, a lot of the classifiers that we have out there is really about, let's say if it's above 50%, you mark as true, else it marks as false. So it's really about uh, putting a bit of transparency about that. So this ML score threshold is what we did call on past reports as being the flagging aggressiveness. So last round, I think it was 70% or 80%. Uh, the main, the main point of that is that, for example, if you set to 50%, you are going to maximize accuracy. Uh, but not necessarily we are interested in maximizing accuracy. Sometimes we are interested in maximizing other things, like, for example, uh, we want to make sure that, for example, we do not flag user, users wrongly. So we want to, for example, we want to maximize it, uh, negative detection rate, rather than positive detection rate. Or we want we want a more specific sensor rather than a more sensitive sensitivity uh, sensor. So the way that we do that on code is really by that we set a threshold that's about fifty percent. And by the way, this is one of the parameters I'm going to show that on the config. But uh, if you go here to the parameters.json, flag threshold is one of those parameters that you can set up. And I mean. It's important to have that, that transparent somewhere. So every report that we do, we always tell that. So I think because I think this is one of the features of the, I mean, this is one of the highlights that we do. We do not uh, do things bling. We do not seek to maximize accuracy. We we seek, we actually aim for doing something that let's say does not uh, generate harm for our users. So I think this is an important thing to highlight. And, and that's sort of it for the, for the predict workflow, uh, it's relatively simple. And then as user, you simply start that on the data lake. So everything that has a star goes to the data lake. You start the hunt predictions and you start the, the flags after it has passed through this uh, threshold. And there is also the prepare human found push and point. Before I go into those two, do you guys have any comments, any questions? have any comments or questions right now but i do think that uh, for the next meeting when will we get a chance to look at the actual outputs danilo how about the following um i can't uh, i'll do a backup of the current uh, bucket i'm going to zip everything and then i'm going to send to the channel how does that help so i'm sorry I, you broke up just a little bit i couldn't hear that so when you say about the output, do you mean? The actual predictions, just the file that has the Git, ah. the, the GitHub account and the actual predictions for the individual, for the individual yes. accounts. So when I do have this prediction. So just that output. Yes. So I would say that 
if we are talking about the summary, uh, I mean, something that we simply provide, it's really this push end point here. Because those are all steps in order okay. to producing data. But uh, let's say there is this step called push end point here, which is, it's going to give test SSB with everything. Uh, you have user, you have ECB according to machine learning, ECB according to heuristics, ECB according to human evaluations, features. So the, this push end point is really the, I mean, it's really the uh, things with spot. Uh, but, but, but in order to generate that, we need to go over all those steps so that we have a number for everything. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So just before going to the push end point, uh, there is also this prepared human value, and I think that Armand is going to appreciate, appreciate that, this one because the, when you pass Python dash MGTC set and you pass prepare human value, what you are going to do is to generate uh, some new human valuation sheets. So I did pass here, it's going to take a while, but after this has been executed, we are going to notice that we are going to have some new uh, sheets here. So let me delete this process here. It's going to take a bit, but let me go over that quickly. So prepare human about workflow. So it works by the following. Uh, you get the current predictions. Uh, I think it's it's a good idea to actually factor that so that it depends on the hand data directly. So I'm going to mark that. But uh, practically speaking, uh, using the predictions after the features on the Hatata set means that uh, you need to use, I mean, you need to execute the prediction before. I mean, you need to do, for example, retrieve data, predict, and then prepare human eval. Uh, that's fine. It's going to use all the data, but it's an additional step that it's not required. But I mean, I've marked it as to do. So, and, and we don't have to talk about it today. Because we have plenty more sessions. I just wanted to be on your mind that I, I do definitely have to look at what the outputs, because for me, we want to make sure that when we recreate the outputs for the community model, that they match as close as possible. Ah. So just having a nice little view, make it super yeah. simple and easy for us. That's all. Yeah. So one thing that I'm going to do uh, after this meeting, I'm going to zip that uh, 113 bucket because it. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to create a compressed file. I'm going to send it to the Discord channel because I think it, this will give the exact, uh, it's going to give out the output that we are generating. And the final output in terms of the endpoint, I'm going to go over then. It's generated by the push endpoint. It's a CSV file. And that, uh, I mean, we, we are going to go over it. So, yeah. So, going back here to the prepared human evaluations. Uh, there are some steps here, like, but the main point is that uh, this is going to, let's say, get the set of uh, predictions that, that we do have. It's going to exclude the ones that has been evaluated already. It's going to split based on some uh, parameters. Those parameters are here. So the thing is that you can configure, for example, how much evaluators you have and how much samples you have for each evaluator. And also if we should evaluate our users or not. By default, I leave it false because if it's false, uh, users that have been evaluated, we are not going to reevaluate. It's going to, I mean, if it's already on the data set, we are not going to go over again. Yes, uh, same. Uh, I, I did just add, uh, actually it was a problem to pull request because it had before, but uh, uh, I mean, I, I'm going to need to send a pull request, but. So, but the code for the push and the point is out there. It's just that, let's say, we did have a trouble when we did a last refactor, when we did switch from using click to our say, arc parser. Um, okay. So, okay. And we have this file here, white uh, woman labels here, which, uh, let me see if it went. Ah, okay, here. So I didn't generate as much as evaluators and samples uh, like Hans 12 because it can take a bit. He, the sheet API is very slow. And this is one of the main reasons of why I need to start update on the data lake after than pulling every time because you have quota limits, uh, it takes forever. But yeah, we did generate here two sheets. 
So, Armand, uh, if you want to run, the, if you want to do all the processes by yourself, what you would need is really to do the prepare predictions. So you need access to the VPN, and then you pass the predict uh, workflow, and you pass the uh, prepare human eval. You pass those three commands, and you are going to have your uh, you are going to have your new sheets here. So it's not hard when it, the environment is set up, but the thing, thing is, you need the VPN, and you need to be able to run. Uh, I mean, you need the environment set up in order to do that. And now the last part, which is the push and uh, workflow. So as I said before, Zen, uh, the push and deploy workflow was on the click. Uh, I mean, on the Azop, it, it, it was available because, I mean, we did use click, but when we did have factor for using Ag parser, for some reason, we we forgot to put it. So I did add here and I did do a commit and I'm going to set up here today so that, I mean, we can reproduce that. But it's pretty, pretty trivial, it's just that. So, uh, Loris, the output of that is going to be this CSV output here. And let me show that. Yeah. While that let me open here the models, just that, and also show some things here. Ah, it's already here. So while it is loading, let me talk a bit how this push and deploy uh, workflow works. So there is a file here about uh, retrieving user results. And let me remember how it works. So what it does, what it does is really that. Uh, create a list of Gitcoin users that contains all of that. The aggregate score, which I'm going to explain, and also features. So you have uh, scores for the predictions, scores for the evaluation. And there is this aggregate score. So this aggregate score is another decision point. And this aggregate score is really about, let's say, uh, what's the importance that we give for the different labels that we have for a single user. So I do have a hacking that explains that a bit uh, uh, better, but the idea is the following. Uh, suppose that you have a single user. You have a human evaluation score for that, for him. You have a risk, uh, you have a risk that says yes or no. And you also have a, a machine learning prediction. Giving out those three numbers, uh, what, what, what's the importance that we give for each for them? Uh, I mean, how we, we, we prioritize between the three? So the logic that works here is the following. If there is a, a human evaluation, the human evaluation uh, always takes pre uh, precedence. So if we have an evaluation, we are not going to use the risk and we are not going to use the machine learning prediction. But the uh, human evaluation represents a very tiny subset of all the data. So if we do not have a human evaluation, we need to choose between the machine learning and the heuristic. If we do have the risk, we use the heuristic. But if we do not have the risk, we use the machine learning prediction. So in a certain sense, what this aggregate score is doing is really giving those three, three sets. We only use machine learning predictions if we do not have, uh, if we do not have anything else. So in a certain sense, the machine, machine learning prediction is sort of a last resort, uh, let's say estimator to tell if someone is CB or not. And there are other ways of defining that, but it's on the aggregate score that defines that. So I want to show the output of that because uh, after we have this aggregate score, we generate that, that list. And there is, on this push and put workflow, what's going to happen is that we do have upload token. And there is an endpoint of the Gitcoin uh, side, which allows to, let's say, they do have a CBU dashboard or something like that. And we do, do need to upload a CSP for them to them periodically so that they can share up the matches. So when you trigger that push and the point workflow, you are doing that. So that's it for the workflows. I want to show this CSV output because I think this is really the select mignon of the of what we are doing here. So yeah, it's going to show to show shortly. Let me open here the predictions too. The model folder, as you can see here, by the way, it's a pico file. So uh, nothing special. Let me open here the labels too. So 
for example, Laura, so this is the predictions, uh, Jason. So this is the machine machine learning score for each Gitcoin user. You have it's it's a map user score, user number, user number. It's going to be a number between zero and one. And for the CSV output, uh, it's that I I can say to you if you want. Uh, but the main point is you have handle, you have the aggregate score. Mm -hmm. So the aggregate score is the, is the ground truth. The aggregate score is zero or one. Uh, zero is not CB, one is CB. It's, and then you have other fields like uh, the prediction score, the evaluation score, and the risk score. So the aggregate score is computed from those three. And after I have those, those things here, which is really what I'm going to consume, I do have the features. So those, those features, they are here more for reference than for anything else. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. But in the end point, uh, what, what the end point is really used, what the Gitcoin people are really using is really this aggregate score, and which is based on those three. Ah, uh, all right, cool. Thank you. Uh, uh, and I'm going to send you a zip file with a back, with a backup of this uh, Hans 13. So just so that you have a schema for everything, so that you can have a example of a data for every step. So you are, you are going to have access for for that. All right, thank you. That'd be awesome. Cool. That's what that's what I need. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And for example, this is. Uh, those are the labels, for example, for the risk field. You have, for example, a set of civil handles and a set of trusted handles. And yeah. So that concludes the workflow. And by, by also showing the output, I think that we actually did it two in one. So now we have uh, 40 minutes to really go over the environment. Uh, by the way, any questions about the output, about the workflows? Um, or any comments before we continue? I think I'm okay so far. Yeah. The good thing about being recorded is that we upload that afterwards, so we'll have a reference points afterwards. So let's go to the environment, which is uh, maybe the trickiest part because so far we've been using a clean environment and so this makes things a bit easier so what i'm going to do is the following um, so i do have several files here on the config which they are required in order to be able to run things so what i'm going to do is the following i'm going to delete everyone and we are only done when we are able to pass the test so let me delete here, delete that, delete this two. Not too important. Okay. So the reason of why I did delete out those files is that uh, if you do not have them, you are not going to be able to run the test. So let me run. Actually, let me just run everyone and see what happens. Well, that let me open here the, the agenda again. Interview. So, when the test gets failed, uh, let, let's do the first two things here, which is because we need those two a GCS bucket and a human evaluation sheet. A uh, GCS bucket is exactly pretty trivial. If you go, if you have Google Cloud Platform and you have a project, you just go to the navigation menu, cloud storage, browser. You are going to have that list and you can create a bucket. Like, for example, let's create one here called uh, Workshop One. Or, yeah. Well, it is loading. Let me see. Yeah, they didn't say you are. So create a bucket, it's really simple. You just press the button and you assign a name. So I'm going to call that workshop one. You select where to start the data. Uh, there are several things involved. Hmm, already taken. So that's the side workshop.
and there is the story on your data. Usually it's a good idea, multi-region, if you want to maximize availability, but if you want actually to maximize, let's say, not having costs, the best one is to just get a single region. And the class, I do recommend the standard because the other ones, they are not suitable for your, our use cases, unless we are not going to update it. There are some things here about uh, access control. It's possible to have access control file by file. It's pretty modular. And one thing, and I think this is a thing, yeah, because if we are going to use that for production, and we are going to use GCP, uh, there are options, for example, like, for example, the object uh, version and the retention policy that can be very interesting because, for example, the retention policy forbids the user for deleting the files. This is very interesting for us for keeping track of the provenance and so on. I, I'm going to put as known, but uh, if we deploy to production, we should definitely uh, consider a retention policy, a pretty strict one. So now I'm creating yeah, here. basically you can get some alerts and uh, yeah. Yes. And also go back in time and so on. Uh, there are a lot of options there. They they do increase the cost, but I don't think it's a good deal. So yeah, I do, I did create here the bucket. I do not do need to do anything else because all the other things when I wrote the workflows they are going to generate. And yeah, we still didn't have any failed tests. But the other thing that I need to do is to create a spreadsheet. So the simplest way to do that is simply the following. You create, you pick a, a existing sheet, like this one, and you simply make a copy. And let's, let's call that the workshop one, give me evaluation. So I'm going to create. So one thing about uh, the sheet here, um, first one is that the sheet, the sheet name instructions, it's reserved. So the sheet, the sheet instructions is never going to be used by the, by the service when it's pulling data. If you create a sheet that has any other number different for instruction, it's going to consume and it can turn through an error. So it's one thing to keep in mind. Of course, it's possible to modify the code, but yeah. So I did create here workshop one. And yeah, I did clone. Uh, it's important to have at least one sheet in order to, I mean, just to make sure that the service has access to any data. So it could be something as simple as that. I'm going to mark everyone here as CBU, actually, let's say, just so that we do not uh, generate fake results. And one important thing when you create a new sheet to take note is the spreadsheet ID. So the spreadsheet ID is this thing here. It, uh, take note of that because uh, this is what allows, let's say, the, the service to access that. And, oh, we didn't have any error. So what did happen here is that I think that I did skip the test. So where is my guess code? Yeah, so I, I need to take a... The good thing about GitHub is that, I mean, even if you do a commit that the pull request is not accepted, you still have the history, so you can retrieve what did happen. Yeah. Yeah, about the GCP tests that they, yes. Uh, right now, the service as it is, it's not using the environment bars. It, we could have factor for using, and it would be better. It's more aligned to best practices. So it's possible to do GCP tests also if we define very well what's the project, what's the bucket, and so on. But, to, but this requires some decisions that have not yet, uh, they've been not been yet taken. So I think it's here, you know, quality of life improvements. So uh, what did happen here is that there are a lot of tests here that I wanted to run, but uh, they, did, they did got skipped. So one way of, let's say, not skipping them, but still having those ni this nice visual here is really to use uh, VS Code settings.json. So what I'm going to do here is to retrieve the settings.json that got rejected here. So we do have those nice lines. 
So let me create here a VS Code setting of JSON. Yeah. So that will be way better. So let's run, for example, this test cloud and this test human eval and this test retrieval and test YouTube. The workflows are not going to do that for now because it's tricky. It's a bit longer. So, okay, I did create the JSS bucket and the evaluation sheet. And we already had, for example, our first errors here. And those errors that I'm getting here is because of the credentials. So, for example, if I go to the read uh, human flags and I take a click button and pick error, it's going to tell uh, not such file credentials, human file sheet, and so on. So, uh, one nice uh, benchmark that you can have in order to make sure that you are ready to execute the SAD or not is really the test. If it's failing any test, you are, I mean, if you enable for autos, uh, autos fixture here, so it's not being passed, uh, you are not able to hunt the test side. You need to make sure that, I mean, it's properly set up. So this is a nice benchmark that you could have. So let's go one by one here. So the first one, uh, we need a GCP service account. And this service account is also related to the Google Sheets of API. So the exact instructions about how to do that, if you go here to the docs, I did put some pointers here, like for example, how to create service account. And for the spreadsheet, there is this link here that provides some instructions. I mean, it requires some time, but let's go over it. So for example, uh, where's the agenda? So for the service account, uh, we really go, we really go here on this link. So this link is going to go on the GCP admin and it's going to allow to create a service account and also to generate a JSON file. So let me create one here just to show the step-by-step. -step. Uh, well, that let's see, let's, have a peek on what we need. So after GC, the GCP, we also need to make sure that we have the Sheets API activated. We need to create a GitHub token in order to extract the data from there. We need to set up the parents.json, which is associated with the SAD itself. There is also the cloud definitions, which is another important thing, and also the VPN. So let's see if I, we can go one by one here. Actually, it's not a service account here. It's a bit slow, but while the service account there loads, I'm going to show this config dot parents here so that we do not get blocked. So this parents dot JSON controls some important things. So First one is the spreadsheet ID. So we were using the GR13 here right now, but now that we have a new one, we need to copy that ID here. So we copy here and put here on the parents.json. This is important because if not, we are going to use the wrong sheets and we are going to have wrong labels. There is also the hand start. So ideally the hand start should be set up on the exact timestamp when the hand 13 starts. It's not set up that because it didn't start yet. So I did, I just put any date so that we could test, but we could put something like, for example, 25 here. The flag threshold is really the aggressiveness of your ML predictions. So not aggressive, actually it's the inverse aggressiveness. So for example, if I want to have a very aggressive prediction, I would put 0 0.1 or even 0 0.2. But if I want to be very conservative, if I want really to maximize specifics, I would put something like 0 0.9. So there is no right choice. There is no better value. So the ideal thing is either you assume one or either you do an exploratory data analysis in order to make sure that you are confident, but it's a free parameter and it's one that could even be tweaked by the community if we could have a process for that. If you adopt, I would simply recommend to leave it at 
There is the evaluation threshold. So this evaluation threshold is really about that aggregate, uh, about what, what makes uh, something civil in regards to the HEMA evaluation or not. So remember that score that we did had, uh, for example, if someone is civil and the confidence is high, the score is one. If someone is civil but the confidence is so-so, the score is 0 0.8, it's 80%. So this evaluation threshold is really about making the cut between CB or not based on that. So 0 0.9 means that we are only getting high confidence CBUs. But for example, if we want a uh, medium confidence CBUs too, we would pass, for example, 0 0.7. So this is an, another thing that needs to be set up and needs to be transparent. And this is important for Armand, uh, but here you also control, for example, how much evaluators you have per round and how much samples per round. So for example, on Houdster uh, 12, we did have 20 evaluators and 50 samples. So you also set up that here. And the evaluator our users, which is false, uh, unless, unless you really want to handle a sample, I would recommend to leave that as false because else it's going to be inefficient. But, but I mean, it, it's a free parameter too. Well, that, uh, yeah. So that was parents.json. Going back here to the GCP service account, now that the page has loaded. So those are the service accounts. And in order to create one, we simply press this button here. And let's call that, that one, for example, workshop one. And let's create that. And it's important to select a good name here because uh, you are going to need to remember the email associated with that service account. I'm going to show afterwards. And the whole that you need to provide here, you need to uh, provide access to the cloud storage. So let me put here cloud storage. I'm not sure if it's here. Maybe it's in another place. Uh, I think it's managed permissions. So while it is happens, another thing that you need to do is to get this email here, copy and paste that, copy that, and go to the human evaluation sheet, go to share. And on the share, you need to provide a view and edit access to that email. Because if not, that service account is not being able to, to access the spreadsheet. So let's see whoever gets first here. Let's try to multitask that. Okay, so the sheets went first. So, ah, it's hard start. Oops, the wrong one. So, workshop one. Thank you. And now I need to create a JSON, a JSON key here for this workshop one service account. I think that the service account is exactly associated with my user. So maybe it does not need permission. Uh, loading here. Yeah, thanks a lot. So, okay, I did one step here to associate the spreadsheet purpose with the service account, but I need to create that key that's going to use as a GCP credential and also a credential for the sheet. 
while it is is happening, let me see if I can multitask another thing. So let me put this code here. And let's close that guy here and close that one. Yeah, so those two here are in progress, but we do need a GitHub token. So let me, oops. Ah, and there is also the cloud definitions here, which is another important thing that we need to do on our own. So let's go here. It's this GTC cloud definitions. So GTC cloud definitions. Yeah, so what this controls is the following. The default prefix is the name of the bucket that we are using. So in our case, it's going to be BSI workshop one. Uh, the cloud creds is, what are the credentials that we are using for GCP? So I'm going to pass here simply as GCP. And that's it. Uh, okay, let me see one thing here. Yeah, they are all mapping to this credential in the future. So I'm going to do a trick instead of, I'm going to use simply this one here. So this file here, credentials, uh, humanvalsheets.json, it needs to, it's the JSON key for our service account at GCP. So I do not have that file, so I need to download one, but I unblock it here by the browser. Hopefully we'll, have by the end of the workshop. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a good idea to move the environment bar. This is uh, definitely an improvement. Uh, I mean, uh, so, okay. So GTC cloud definitions.py is done, parent.json is done. Uh, enable Google Sheets API. Ah, there is another catch here about the Google Sheets API. Because not only you need the service account that you need to share with that, uh, but here on the GCP, there is, a, there is a tab here called, let me see if I can find. I think it's APIs and keys. It, ah, APIs and services. So on the library, there is a, you need to allow uh, Google spreadsheets here. The exact details about how you go, to, uh, go over it, just in case I'm not able to go over. Uh, it's contained here on the operations manuals on here, on the, this doc G spread here file. Because this is uh, the documentation of the library that we use for consuming from the human evaluation sheets. So there are some detailed instructions here about how to enable that. But hopefully we'll be able to do it. And still loading. I'm going to refresh to see if we can get it. Let me see if we can do something else. Yes, we also need the GitHub token. So let me open here to see. Yeah, that one was faster. So the GitHub token is really, you just generate a new token. Uh, keep in mind that the GitHub token here, it's, a, it's associated with a personal account. Uh, maybe it's, maybe, I'm not sure exactly what's the best way of, to approach that. Maybe we could, for example, maybe it's possible to create a GitHub profile for the DAO that we, we just recycled the token, or maybe there is another way of getting a token. So yeah, I just need to log in here with my GitHub. That's the trouble with, with passwords. They require you to log in when you least have internet. It's a problem with those password managers too. I already got locked, I think, two or three times. That's it. Ah, yeah. Uh, so the, on the admin, I, I, 
I'm my tab here for these are, these are already open. So may, let me click here this key, uh, button here, add key and create new key for the workshop one user. So you need to use JSON. Yes, I think this is a good thing to look then. And Wally, ah, yeah, so it, yeah, so we already got a milestone here. We have the credentials now. So let me move that to, to the, what is this code here? Yeah, we got our first credential. Let's see. So, yeah, the way that I did put here on the club definitions and sort of is the other ways is that. So let me rename it that. And yeah, good. So I think it is will allow us to host some tests already, like for example, the ones associated with cloud. So yeah, let me run that. Let me also run that and that. And when it is happening, and then we need the GitHub token in order to run the test GitHub and the PSQL connection string and IP in order to run that. Let me see this. Ah, and there is this to test the credential. So, ah, and there is a problem here. Let me see why. No file found. So credentials, zoom in val. Ah, I, I, I put on the plural, so it's not a sheet, it's sheet. Actually, let me see if I didn't. Yeah. Uh, just a type on the file, but, but I think it is now it's right. So that's why tests are useful because I mean, you can catch uh, those kinds of errors very quickly. So let's test here the credential. I think it will, it will pass now. Oh, not yet. GCP can be. Yeah, so I, I'm going to do a hack here, which is the following because because it can enter the same credential, which should really have factors to just use one service account instead of two. Ah, now it passed. That's a good thing. So let's test this one, I'll test this one. So this is a good thing because uh, with those credentials, we are, are already able to interact with the cloud to download and uh, hit data. It's shared with, uh, yeah, so the main reasons then of why there are two, it's really because it's legacy code because origin, originally we had a credential just for the spreadsheet and then we did add the data link, uh, functionally afterwards. But it was sort of a separate feature, so, um, yeah, I would say that it's really about, yeah, it's, sometimes it's, it's what happens when, let's say, you merge two uh, work streams and you merge you merge different, different code. But I think it would be better to ju have just one. I think it's, I don't see why not. Okay, so you can see, for example, that the test human, human flags already worked. So what this means is that uh, our code was able to go to the spreadsheet that we just created and, and work through it. And actually, let, let's, let's do one thing. Uh, let me open uh, the spreadsheet here. Just to, uh, who, who wants to be a CBU? I, I, need a, I need one CBU and one not CBU here. Me, me, I wanna be CBU. <laughs> so what, what's your GitHub uh, profile, Armand? Uh, uh, it yeah. should be the same name, Sir Lupin Watson. Sir Lupin. Uh, uh, you, you need my, my GitHub account? Yeah. Ah, so Zengatsu. So Zengatsu, are you CBU or not CBU? 
and there is also Sir Loop. How how was it? I don't quite remember. Yeah, no, not so, one. Uh, don't put a one at the end. It's yeah. uh, Sir Lupin Watson without uh, the number. Yeah, okay. I changed yes, it. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to mark the gut so it's highly civil too. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, uh, let, let's see if, if it's going to work. So in order to Hey guys, so back to Sharon. Yeah. Yeah, you, you were just starting to say uh, who's a Sybil and uh, Zen, and then uh, you were you were about to start. So, okay, I did put uh, you and Zegatsu here as highly civil. So let's see if it's going to work. So there is a trick which is the following. Uh, I'm going to go here to hit human flags. I'm going to put here a breakpoint. And I'm going to run that on debug mode to see what we have. By the way, uh, VS Code debug mode, it's the, I mean, I mean, it's the most useful thing that it has ever been invented. So just wait a bit. Because what's going to happen is that when I get here on the breakpoint on the execution, it's going to show me everything that's happening under the hoods. Well, it is happening, let me do something else. So new personal token, workshop one. And so I don't quite remember. Uh, let, let me hear maybe where, where it is. So I, I think it does, it does not depend that any permission at all. So I will just create this token here without anything. Still running. Okay. Ah, okay. So here we are. Uh, so this is split at the stage zone that's going to be starting on the data lake. So if we open that, there is the test sheet here, as you can see. There is also this his uh, dash dash one thing. So this his uh, sheet, uh, what did happen is that when I did do the, the right test, uh, it didn't create a new uh, new sheet. But I think that with the internet, it got some error. But I mean, this is the failed writing test, essentially. A partially successful test, but OK. So I did put you and Zegats here at the test. So you can see that, for example, Zegats and you are already here is civil true, high confidence, and so on. So yeah, it's a validation that uh, we are able to consume given, the, given that now we have that service account. Oops. Uh, yeah, I, I pressed the wrong, wrong button here. But yeah, cool. Uh, it's always cool to see things in practice. And I mean, this is a nice way, by the way, if you guys, for example, want to see how things work and so on, a nice trick to do is really you put a breakpoint somewhere. And when you put a breakpoint, you go here to the testing and you run on the bug mode. This is a super nice way of, I mean, see what are the variables. And you can even pass, for example, some comments here. So for example, let me put here, there is this debug terminal here, which is also, I mean, super, super productivity increasing. Like for example, let me pass here. So for example, I could pass something, for example, what's the value of credentials scope? It's just like interactive terminal, but on the middle of the program. I'm just sharing with that because I did use Python for two or three years and I didn't know that this existed. And when I discovered that this exists, everything has changed for me. For me. So I always share when I have the opportunity. Uh, okay, so let's go now to the GitHub account here. So I do have a, a token here. So I think it's this one here. So yeah, let me remember here at the moment. It's GitHub token. GitHub token dot xt. And let's see if the GitHub test is passing. So where it is. So test GitHub, let's see if it's working. And also let me see the cause of the error of this writing one. 
่าอย่างนั้นแต่สักทีแต่ anyway we have a good news the test for GitHub out there work it and by the way uh, if If you out the test is here working, most probably the workflows are going to work by itself. But you can always hunt here just to make sure. So I think that the biggest missing piece right now in order for you to be able to set up the environment is really the PostgreSQL. And the tricky thing about the PostgreSQL is that uh, there is no easy way around it. You need a connection string from, from the Gitcoin platform. And also you need a static IP. There is no way around that. Uh, so if you guys want, I can send a, a handle of someone, of the guy that did uh, provide me access. But you need to provide him a static IP and ask for the connection string. There is no way around that. And as I said before, the quick and dirty way for getting a static IP is really pure VPN. So I did write, I think I did write here on the homework. Because pure VPN, uh, if you have, I, I think it, I think it was $30 or something like that. If you have that, uh, you get one year of the decade IP and it do so quickly. Not a not, not ideal long-term solution, but we work for the short term. And you get the IP and... So I'm going to, uh, for that test, I need to actually shift. So where is my finder here? Yeah, so given that we have this blocker, there is no way around it. I need to get my connection string here and copy inside that. And now let me pick here for, v for VPN and let me connect again. Takes a while. But as of now, uh, it seems that almost all tests are passing. Just this hand data that not, let me see why not. It seems some kind of connection error. Let me try again. And also I'm going to test here the PSQL and also the retrieval full. Let me see if I can talk through anything else while you learn on that. Yeah, so it is also the thing about the API here. So one thing that should be enabled, I think it was the spreadsheet API. Let me see if I can find that. There are some instructions on the Manual. So for example, if you go here to the operation manual and we go to this doc here, it's going to give some instructions about the spreadsheet interaction. Ah, I think I know why. Let me double check if I did uh, share properly that. Yeah, it says there. Yeah, there is one thing I hear about. So one thing that should be enabled on the project too is the API access. So here on the API library, you should enable the Google Sheets API and also the Google Drive API. Let me see the tests. Ah, yeah, the PostgreSQL worked. Now let, let's see this hand data here. If that test here passes, I think that we can do a last run of the workflows and have a uh, last set of questions and we can call it done the workshop. So,
Yeah, for some of his next aborted. Yeah. So I'm going to suppose that this is maybe related to my internet connection because I'm having to post time out, out a tiny. So let's try to have some uh, work, uh, workflows here and see if it's working properly. So let's start. So Python M dash M. Let's start with the first one, which is prepare pred prediction. If this is that, pre uh, prepare prediction. So anything that you do, the first thing that you need always to do is this prepare prediction because this is what is going to actually collect the, the data. By the way, while it is, is running, do you guys have uh, any questions or comments? Well, I, 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 I may have, you know, a few questions, uh, but uh, like, I'm just going to stick with the recording so far. I think uh, the, there's a lot of uh, uh, information to, you know, to understand, I think at this point to, uh, but it's, uh, it's great. Yeah, I understand it. That's why I wanted to do this workshop and record it because um, it, it's good to take the time and try by yourself. Now it's scrapping the GitHub users. It has already collected with the... Ah, by the way, uh, notice one thing. Uh, the last time that we did run the, this prepare prediction workflow, uh, it did not scrap users because I did, we did already scrap it before because of the last week hands. Now it's scrapping because given that I have created a new bucket and there is an entirely new data set, it needs to scrap all the users uh, again. So it's going to take you seven minutes. Hopefully we will not get a quota limit because sometimes it happens. And it's one thing that let's say if you inspect the code, you are going to see that there are several places where you have a sleepy, let's say, instead of scrapping the users without the speed that you can, you actually scrap just one user per second. And the reason being is that if not, uh, you are going to get a quota error. That's another reason of why we need the data lake because we do not have any limitation to data lake, but. So for example, scrapping out the GitHub users when we need to do a prediction feed, it adds a lot of time on the process. Same thing for the spreadsheet. And uh, the operation model.md, I did put some uh, typical sequences. So for example, one sequence is you simply want to, for example, update the machine learning predictions for the data. And it's really about you pass prepare prediction and then you pass the prediction uh, workflow. Just by doing that, you have new results. Uh, but another one, uh, Suppose that, for example, we have uh, new new labels. Like, for example, uh, we we did do a human evaluation hunt. So, I mean, we have this set of new human labels. One set, one uh, sequence that you could pass is prepare prediction and then prepare training because when you pass prepare training, you are going to put those labels from the sheet, and you fit the module. So you have this new module that you could uh, pass prediction again. This is another possible sequence. And there is the sequence of also generating the, uh, the sheet for the human evaluation. So it's really about the prepare prediction, predict, and prepare human eval. Uh, this is the three commands that you need to invoke in order to make sure that we have new sheets that, I mean, have all the users that we could evaluate. So I would say that, let's say, those three sequences in the day to day operations, uh, it's really out that there is to it. Uh, I didn't show a lot of the internals, but I mean, the main reason of why we have those workflows is really to, I mean, not having to go too deep. Just by having that simple sequence, you do everything. And there is also this push in the point which should be triggered. I mean, I, I, 
at a determined points where we want to push the results to the dashboard. So it could be after every prediction, it could be one time per day. It really depends on how much frequent we want to update the dashboard. But it could be as much we would like after a update ML results. And those workflows, uh, I mean, if you see the diagram that it is on the readme, uh, they sort of encapsulated. The readme is sort of auto-dated. I mean, we perhaps we could update that, but it, where is the diagram? Yeah, so we did have that, ah, here it is. So the prepare predict uh, workflow is really about this blue box here. And the prepare training uh, workflow is really about the head box and the retrieve human lab labels. The fit, uh, Actually, this fit predict should be split into two because now we have three, the fit and the predict are on different steps right now. And the push and the point and the predict related to the prepare sanction. But I definitely think we should update that diagram in order to reflect what we have right now. Right now. So more for a minute. So I will do one thing. I'll stop sharing here quickly to see if it goes more quickly. While that, I think, it, I mean, essentially we have free discussion time right now. We have that homework that we need, a PostgreSQL connection that's that KP and needs to be set up. And, and I think that the idea on the workshop too on this Wednesday would be really that the community can uh, replicate uh, those workflows. I mean, be able to pass the, the workflow commands and see, for example, if yeah, there sure. is let any catch. Yeah, let me see what Lawrence this week and uh, no lead in the team, you know, uh, what's the best uh, that uh, we, we can uh, actually, you know, get um, um, the, like the VPN for the static AP addresses, uh, remote access set on, and um, we, we should be good. I mean, it's not a big deal um, at this point, uh, you know, what's gonna be the best uh, for, or, you know, like our own access from the, the data lake. And uh, uh, I don't see any issue in there, uh, but I'm just trying to understand like the the, 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 the access with the VPN access, like why is, is like there's no way around uh, that uh, situation? Like uh, I, I, why do we need like the VPN access? Is this to access because there's like a, 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 a range of IP that we need to, to be on or? So it's a requirement in order to access the production database for, for Gitcoin. Because for, okay, they say that it's for security reasons, but the thing is uh, access to their production database depends on a whitelist of IPs. And uh, they, we yeah, need to set yeah. IPs so that they add to that whitelist. Okay, okay. So you can always basically use that uh, st static IP and uh, just basically yeah, and, on, uh... yeah, and the VPN is really a way so that, let's say, you know, never lose the RFP. So and yeah. let me suppose. A... Yeah, it will keep the uh, the same uh, registered key. Um... Yeah. By the way, just uh, 30 seconds here, and I think it's going to, the data is going to be started on the book. So you guys wait uh, 20 seconds, we can see if it worked or not. Mike, can you use any other like uh, VPN, uh, basically like any other company or uh, the one that, uh, what, what's the name again of the, the one uh, you were talking about? And uh, like uh, basically the, the um, is there like any specific location or you choose like uh, how does it work? Like so there are several VPN providers. Uh, 
UVPN is one of them. Uh, you could select the location. Uh, I wouldn't say that UVPN is the better. I mean, there are options. Uh, I think that the main reason why I took a VPN was because it was, yeah, it was easy enough, but there is, I wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, okay, pure, uh, pure VPN can give you like a dedicated uh, yes. IP address uh, is saying in yes. the chat, which is great. So, it does not. Uh... Yeah, so that's the thing. The VPN yeah, this most... is what we need. Yes. Yeah, and no, usually, what, uh, maybe, uh... and usually the dedicated oh, sorry, IP is uh, optional. Uh, you need to pay separately. Actually, the dedicated IP is okay, way okay. more expensive than the VPN itself. Okay. Well, is if this, this is what we need, I guess uh, I'm I'm gonna look with uh, maybe you know like I'm gonna look around and see. Uh, I, I I know uh, one VPN provider which is pretty great. Uh, I'm not sure if they can provide you like a dedicated IP addresses, but uh, I'm going to look into it and uh, I'm going to see you know, like uh, what can we do about it and what's the best uh, in this case 40 like to two. I, I guess we will need more than one access. Uh, so. Yeah. So the data here is extracted and now it's right into the cloud. Uh, I'm hoping. I'm praying here to not get uh, getting a timeout. How it can happen? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing, you know. Fail the old uh, setup. But I understand you know, like. Uh, when are you? When are you? Uh, like, are you in Brazil? <gasps> Sorry, for a while or? Ah, I do live here. Uh, because what happened is that. Um, I mean, I I did went to travel with a friend, but the place that we did go here I, I didn't expect to be so remote so uh, I, I was expecting okay, better okay. internet <laughs> hey scale uh, so i'm not sure uh, i'm not exactly the best expert on vpn uh, solutions uh, i'm not exactly aware of the tail scale I don't know that there are a lot of VPN providers that provide dedicated IPs. Ah, right, we got a timeout, but, so. Oh, okay. Doesn't matter, yeah, so, I mean. Yeah, I was hopeful to at least uh, show the bucket that we created here with a uh, right file. But, but that's okay, uh, I yeah. mean. Uh, the test did work, so it would it will work also the workflows. And I mean, with the VPN, uh, and I think that the critical piece is really the VPN and the connection string. It's because the GCP credentials and GitHub access token, we can sort out super quickly. Yeah. So yeah, I think that we are good then. Uh, so yeah, uh, any, any other things, guys? or we're good. I think we're pretty good for now. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, um, I, I mean, uh, I'm gonna wait for the next uh, workshop, next episode. And uh, it was great. I mean, uh, I, I really, I, I like it because there was a lot of content. So uh, I personally really prep better like, you know, to, to do a workshop, a few workshops like that. And uh, instead of just having like a, you know, I'm, I'm dropping a, a README and just, it, it's both as possible, but uh, it's great to have also a combination of both. Uh, and uh, especially with Google Cloud Platform, you know, you can make your, uh, it's 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 great. Uh, like I personally, you know, I had, uh, like you can do the same with, uh, you know, with Microsoft Azure. It's just, that, you know, their services is, are, are, are different and, uh, you know, control access is also different, uh, et cetera. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm also probably, and maybe that would, that's one place where, for example, having two credentials could help because for Google Sheets, there is no way avoiding ha needing to have a GCP one. But for the bucket, for the GCS thing, is that there is no blocker at all at using Amazon, for example, or even other things like Azure. 
and yeah. Uh, yeah and i mean i did create a document called a uh, operations manual i'm going to push on the repo later today but i did try to put a sequence of instructions that you could use as a reference about uh, how to set up things uh, where to look for for I mean, if you do the entire sequence, uh, you are going to be able to, to run everything. Uh, and I think that, I mean, I, one of the ideas of the workshop too is, I mean, with the company, with the vision and so on, I think it was, this will also help, for example, when you write documentation and so on. It's because for some things, uh, really share the screen helps wonders. But, but yeah, I have for the feedback and yeah, We'll have workshop to ah, let me see. Yeah, we'll have workshop to on Wednesday. So yeah, there is the list of homework. So if you guys are able to have access to the course scale, it's going to be very important. And yeah, uh, we'll try to that, do that community room then. then. Hey guys. Uh, guys? Okay. Next one. Ah, hey, guys. And... Yeah, I can hear you. Ah, hey, guys. So, yeah, guys. Uh, uh, well, I will wait to. We'll see again in workshop two and then. Um... So yeah, thanks for the feedback. For, thanks for staying in and for the patience too. And yeah, happy for doing with this with all of you. So yeah, thanks. <laughs>